different colonies at the time. Um, and it's uh, after the Seven Years' War in the mid uh, 18th century, so by the 1760s, that uh, the emphasis on colonial governance becomes an even bigger issue um, for the uh, people involved and the provision of foodstuffs becomes a central issue. Now, as the wealth of the colonies grew over time, colonial planners and administrators came to resent these restrictions, right? Because they could only bring uh, goods into these uh, ports, these certain ports, Le Cap, Port of Ponce, and Le Quai. Um, and uh, they could only trade uh, sugar syrups and sugar cane brandies known as taffia. So syrup and taffia. Um, and by 1789, when the colonial deputies were admitted into the National Assembly, um, they began calling for the liberalization of the grain trade. They claimed that there was a famine in Saint-Domingue um, and deputies like Louis Marc, uh, uh, the Marquis de Gouy d'Arcy and Nicolas Robert, the Marquis de Cocherel, um, would claim that the merchants that were uh, provisioning the island were woefully um, in, uh, unable to do so um, and that they needed to actually adopt those policies that um, Shilo, the governor general, had adopted earlier. Moreover, they believed that the shortage of cash in the colony also required that you allow more goods to be exchanged, so more than syrup and tafia. Um, for the colonial uh, administrators, the restrictions were part of a nefarious plot. This is where it gets a little weird for them. Um, they say that there is this cabal of merchants and um, metropolitan uh, royal officials that are actually conniving to starve the colonies in order to generate profits and raise uh, the prices of their goods, right? Because the only way that the colonies can get uh, wheat, uh, wheat um, is to import it from France. They're not allowed to get it from the United States. They're not allowed to get it from anyone else. They have to import it directly from France. And so they see this as a plot to starve the colonies. Um, and then they start accusing the, the merchants who are responsible for this of intentionally um, starving their slaves. And they begin to put slave consumption at the center of their argument. Uh, they argued that the, the main concern of the colony was uh, to provide for the subsistence and, uh, of their slaves. Um, they said slaves were most vulnerable to shortages. The Comte de Renault maintained that planners were only interested in alleviating the harsh conditions of their enslaved laborers. Um, uh, that, then they start uh, making arguments about the slave deaths involved. So Jean Berry de saint venant estimated about 1 million uh, Blacks had died since the promulgation of these uh, Lettres Patentes uh, instituted in the exclusif. Um, so they're blaming the uh, trade restrictions I mean, the deaths of the slaves on the trade restrictions. Um, despite this concern of the deputies and slave owners for the island, references to malnutrition and lack of uh, provisions were cynical rhetorical strategies used to shift the blame for slave mortality onto the metropolitan merchants. Um, and around the same time too, you have um, growing uh, outrage over uh, planter treatment of their slaves. So the Abbe uh, Reynaud's Histoire Philosophique des Deux Andes um, and the Société des Amis um, de Noir, which is um, abolitionist society, the second one, and um, uh, an enlightenment anti-slavery work in the first one. Um, Five minutes, Jonathan. Yep. Uh, the deputies for uh, supporting the merchants actually make a very interesting argument. First of all, they just accuse the planners of being unpatriotic, but in they, they go full kilter and 
end up saying there's no famine here um, and that actually black slaves and free people of color do not consume bread at all. That's only what rich whites do. Um, and they end up saying, we ask the monsieur, the deputy of the Saint-Domingue, where is this perpetual famine so maintained by the merchants who starve 10 to 12,000 slaves a year? When one wants to play the celebrated and dangerous role of the accuser, it is necessary to gather the facts. Um, and so, but despite this debate over slaves uh, consumption, um, and this concern over it, I would say both of them, both of these type of arguments are doing something very interesting in that they're excluding the active role of slaves in the, in the grain markets. Um, well, the merchants are saying that blacks just don't eat wheat and that they love yams and manioc instead. Um, and the uh, colonial planters are doing a more subtle thing. Um, when you look at the number of uh, uh, wheat provisions needed, they don't count free people of color. They just add the population of whites to the population of slaves and said, oh, that's how much what, what wheat that we need. It's a very subtle um, exclusion there. Also, they only imagine provisioning for slaves through their own intervention in the market. So slaves aren't supposed to go to the market, only the masters go to the market and then buy the grain to give to the slaves. Um, and I see this as part of a larger tradition um, that uh, excludes uh, uh, black people from the grain markets. Um, the colonial deputies representing free people of color noted that there were laws that prohibited black people, slaves and free people of color from buying grain in the first place. They couldn't buy bread from a, a baker um, and then when you look at the Code Noir, which is this body of law that uh, regulated uh, uh, the life of Blacks in the colony, um, provisioning was always the task of the master and was always mediated through the master. So Two minutes. again, again um, you get uh, uh, Black agency in the market excluded. And then you also get anthropological texts that say that uh, Blacks only eat um, the vivre de paix. Uh, so essentially like local foodstuffs. So Congolese slaves were known for, were characterized as saying Congo mange banane, Congos, Congolese uh, eat bananas. Um, a lot of slave manuals mention gumbo, maize, man, maniac and cassava, fish, um, and the only whites that would eat would be the racially ambiguous whites, the Creoles, who were said to also eat sometimes maniac. Um, so there, there's a way that um, this market had been racialized, there, uh, that these groups use racialized language in talking about consumption. Uh, wheat flour was always consumed by whites, while maniac is characteristic characteristic of, um, of slaves, uh, free people of color, and uh, white Creoles. Um, and essentially, I, I see this debate as sort of crystallizing these sort of ideas about the difference in consumption. Um, and that while on one hand, you could talk about like colonialism and trade, I think the real root issue here is that what these people are imagining black consumption to even be. Um, this issue eventually dies down with the slave revolt in 1791. Um, and I would speculate too that these ideas about colonial subsistence um, quite possibly played uh, a role in the way that later revolutionaries, especially the emancipation decrees of 93 and 1794 and Toussaint Louverture's uh, labor decree of 1800, the way that they imagined black economic citizenship, right? Since they're all always been excluded from the market, um, what's that say about how their lives after emancipation were, was to be imagined? All right, um, I'll end there.
All right, I'm done. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Let's um, give Jonathan a virtual applause. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, next um, in our panel, we have Jesse Latimer with the title of Visualizing Maize and Grapes as Heritage and Resistance in Emmanuel Martinez Farm Workers Author. Jesse Latimer graduated from Texas Tech University where he majored in anthropology and art history. He has experience in field archeology span research and professional training in culinary arts. Latimer is particularly interested in pre-Columbian and colonial North American and Mesoamerican subsistence strategies and representations in art. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me. There we are. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I will be uh, showing my research for a little known but historically significant piece of artwork by Chicano artist Emmanuel Martinez called Farm Workers Altar. Um, before I begin, I'd like to thank Dr. Leslie Wolf of Texas Tech School of Art for all of her invaluable guidance and support in this project. Um, Emmanuel Martinez's Farm Workers Altar was created in 1967 and first unveiled in March of 1968 at a mass. Um, it was held in Delano, California to celebrate the end of Cesar Chavez's 25 day fast that was meant to rededicate his farm workers rights movement to nonviolence. Um, a crowd of over 6,000 attendants uh, attended for the mass, including farm worker, um, United Farm Workers supporters, Senator Robert F. Kennedy and other civil rights leaders. The 38 by 54 by 36 inch uh, plywood and mahogany altar was painted on five sides in acrylic and currently resides in the collection of the Smithsonian Art Museum, that American Art Museum. Uh, the altar's top, seen on both images to the left, features a stylized cross. The panel at the top left of the slide features a crucified dark skinned Christ, while the panel at the bottom left um, features an indigenous woman holding small stalks and grapes, flanked by ears of maize to, in the corners. The panel at the top right uh, features a cross made of maize. The panel seen at the bottom right uh, shows four different color um, fists wrapped around the United Farm Workers Eagle insignia. As I will argue, the maize depicted signifies the history shared by Chicanos like Chavez and Martinez and the laborers who were active participants of the agricultural workers' rights movement. Likewise, the grapes, another recurring motif seen along the perimeter of the four main sides of the altar, allude to a series of boycotts against non-union California grapes. By 1967, Cesar Chavez and the UFW were organizing boycotts against produce that was raised and harvested under unfair working conditions, particularly at California vineyards, many of which were worked by Chicanos. Delano, California was the site of the first major strike organized by Chavez in 65 and is the very same place where the 6,000 person mask occurred and where Farm Workers Altar was first utilized. Unfortunately, little research has been done on the celebrated Chicano artist Emmanuel Martinez and his works like Farm Workers Altar that respond to the shared experience of the Chicano community and in doing so, also bring awareness to the importance of foodways in the 1960s Chicano heritage. To that end, in this presentation, I will argue that Farm Workers Altar legitimizes and commemorates the resistance and resilience of Chicano communities through the cultural syncretic imagery of maize and grapes, which incorporates Western and indigenous elements to signify a complex and diverse heritage rooted in 20th century US civil rights struggles. This presentation will <clears throat> excuse me, specifically focus on the role of grapes and maize stocks in this work which rendered the altar as a transformative object within the Chicano resistance for workers' rights and the exploitative agricultural systems of the 1960s. Chicano artist and Colorado native Emmanuel Martinez was born in 1947, where he began his artistic career at a very young age, excuse me. In the early 1960s, while living in uh, Xochimilco, Mexico, Martinez uh, assisted renowned Mexican muralist David Siqueiros in the production of The March of Humanity in Latin America, which was finished in 71. Martinez was an activist in the 60s and 70s and produced silk screen printed posters for El Movimiento, also known as the Chicana movement, which emphasized social change and focus on improving agency 
uh, and civil rights for disenfranchised Mexicans and Mexican Americans within the United States. One of these posters can see in the bottom right of the slide. Martinez also worked intimately with movement leaders Mar uh, Cesar Chavez and Corky Gonzalez and assisted with Plan de la Raza Unida, a political party centered around Chicano nationalism. As a painter and sculptor, Martinez has produced large murals and metal sculptures for cities and community organizations across the US. Farmer Cruz Altar stands as one of the few wooden pieces and the only altar in his portfolio, making it a unique intervention into the arts of El Movimiento. El Movimiento sought to define Chicano identity as apart from Mexican or simply just Hispanic, as a way to reclaim their own identity in the racially hostile environment of the mid 20th century United States. Artist Amelia Mesa Baines explains that, quote, the conceptual base of Chicano thinking absorbed elements from various pre-Hispanic cultures, end quote. Likewise, Martinez and his inspiration for Chicano art took much from the indigenous ancestors of modern Mexicans and Chicanos. Regarding Farmer Cruzalter, Martinez syncretically integrated indigenous imagery into the Christian iconography of the uh, altar, creating and conveying new Chicano meanings. Moreover, because Martinez created the work as an altar, it acts as a powerful link to politics, community, and spirituality, and as a platform for transformation. This transformation expresses the phenomenon of transubstantiation, which occurs on a Catholic altar. Wine and unleavened bread undergo a metaphysical conversion into Christ's blood and body, respectively, through consecration. Therefore, transubstantiation is beyond symbolic as it converts common elements into objects of real power and metaphysical substance. Similarly, the images of maize and grapes depicted on Farmer Cruz Altar become consecrated and transformed further beyond symbols of indigeneity and workers' rights. The function of Farmer Cruz Altar as an activated altar space converts the foods depicted into the material embodiments of the Chicano identity that persists despite hardships past and present. Maize has long been tied to Mexican and Chicano identity, established as a staple crop for native populations in Mesoamerica. Maize also has close associations with indigenous bodies in the Americas. For example, the cosmogonic narrative, the Quiche Maya, known as the Popol Vuh, states that the current incarnation of man was formed by the gods from maize after failed attempts to create man from mud and wood. Similarly, uh, the Aztecs revered the maize goddess Chicomicotl, who is discussed in the 16th uh, century Florentine Codex in which it states, quote, indeed, Truly she is our flesh, our livelihood, through her we live, she is our strength, end quote. In Farmer Cruz Altar, Martinez illustrates precisely this role of maize in Mesoamerican societies and his association with belief systems and religious iconography. As you see it left, Martinez forms a cross with the ears of maize. However, the depiction of the cross symbolizes more than a Christian crucifix. It also forms a King Conx, a form created with five points in the shape of a four-sided cross with a fifth point in the center. The King Conx pattern references the pre-Columbian cosmogram in both Maya and Aztec belief systems. Often arranged in a similar four-quartered format, religious calendars and cosmograms form King Conxes seen in the notable example of the Aztec Codex Fejeveri Mayer, seen left. Therefore, by utilizing maize to return to indigenous values and iconography, Martinez once again alludes to a shared past in the present. Moreover, by depicting the cross and Farmer Cruz altar with maize, Martinez shows the syncretism of European and native belief systems and uh, exhibits religious iconography on Chicano terms, which references not only the ancient Mexican past, but also its cultural trauma during the colonial period. During the colonization of the Americas, missionaries attempted to impose Christianity over indigenous traditions, often by finding overlapping concepts and iconography of the colonized natives. One of the most famous is the Atrio Cross at Alcoman in Mexico, created for a 16th century Augustine monastery, which utilizes the syncretic form of the Aztec world tree and Christ's crucifix. Uh, however, these syncretic crosses did not represent the displacement of native belief systems as missionaries attempted but rather the integration of Catholic iconography into native canons. Martinez invokes maize uh, and the overlapping forms of King Kunks and a crucifix to hearken back to indigenous belief systems while integrating Christian influences. Similarly, on the panel seen on the left, Martinez has an, uh, depicts an indigenous woman grasping grain stalks. The grain the woman holds appear to be the color and size of wheat, a crop introduced through colonialism such uh, just like Christianity, and a grain used for Holy Communion bread. 
The forms also appear bulbous, a uh, cone-like shape with kernels bunched close together rather than a long, narrow, double road typical of wheat. Despite the size and color, the kernel shape recalls maize, a round base that narrow towards the tip and the kernels that wrap around the entire form. Rather than wheat, I suggest that Martinez may be depicting an early variety of maize closer to its wild ancestor, Teosinte, cultivated in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. It was smaller than today's crop and was similar to size in wheat. Varieties of Tansiute can be seen in this image here. Um, Martinez here capitalizes on the overlapping forms and meanings of the maize and wheat. Wheat holds significance in Christianity as a divine crop, according to the books of Deuteronomy and Psalms, and is considered the finest crop bestowed by God. Moreover, just as wheat's product bread is used to represent the body and, uh, of Christ, maize holds a similar symbolic value as a divine crop and the substance of the body in Mesoamerican cosmogonies. By depicting an ancient new world crop that closely resembles old world wheat in both form and religious significance, it further develops the syncretic nature of the altar. Excuse me. Additionally, the two modern ears of maize at the size of the woman seen at right contrast the ancient maize in her hands and illustrates the continuity of the past to present through the biodynamism of maize. Um, that is the process of change endured over centuries. The small ancient gra grain held by the woman recalls the ancient indigenous crop and associated pre-Columbian cultures. The modern ears of maize, fully grown and ripe, embody the resulting selective, the result of selective and crossbreeding over millennia similar to how the indigenous peoples of Americas have seemingly altered from centuries of colonial contact, shifting power dynamics and outside influences. Despite Five more minutes, Jesse. Oh, thank you. Uh, despite this, 20th century Chicanos still retain their ancestral indigenous roots, just as modern maize still carries the genetic code of ancient Teosinte. This idea of continuity is seen further in Farm Workers' Altar. Despite the fact that this piece is a Christian altar with Christian iconography, indigenous symbols pervade throughout the work. These symbols illustrate the cultural continuity from pre-Columbian Mesoamericans to 1960s Chicanos. Like maize, grapevines permeate throughout the entire artwork across each panel of farm workers altar. As a working altar for a mass through the phenomenon of transubstantiation, Martinez's depiction of grapes prefigures the Holy Communion wine that becomes the blood of Christ in the Christian faith. Similar to how we discussed Martinez's use of maize to prefigure the body of Christ in the Chicano people. However, unlike maize, grapes do not have a deep cultural association with Mesoamerican cultures. Rather, grapes signify the religion and culture of both the historical European colonizers and oppressive work conditions in the 20th century United States by visually and socially framing the scenes depicted on the altar. Wine and vineyards were introduced to the Americas by European colonizers and the 1960s became the subject of nationwide boycotts. Despite this, Parallels exist between the physical sacrifice and suffering of Christ on the cross, the suffering of the Chicano laborers, and the suffering of Chavez during his 25-day fast. In this photograph on the left, you can see how exhausted Chavez looks after his fast. The overlapping themes of unjust suffering and sacrifice create new meanings for the grapes for 1960s Chicanos, so much that through the same process of transubstantiation that converts wine into the blood of Christ, it converts the grapes on the altar into the blood of Chicano workers that have suffered at the hands of the farming industry. In conclusion, Martinez's Farm Workers Altar integrates both Christian and indigenous iconography to illustrate the identity and heritage of Chicanos in the 1960s through food. The function of the altar transforms and elevates the foods and, and forms depicted on the altar into material embodiments of the Chicano identity. Maize and its associated forms call back to pre-Columbian culture and religion and its overlapping meanings of wheat, with wheat in Christendom. Grapes take on new meanings when they become a major platform for the UFW to advocate for Chicano rights and empowerment. The depiction of grapes by Martinez in the context of the great boycotts validates the feelings of injustice experienced by Chicanos and the efforts by groups like the UFW that advocate for Chicano agency in the racially hostile United States. Together, these aspects of farm workers alter work together to actualize Chicano agency and legitimize the heritage and resistance of the 1960s Chicano community. And that's everything. Thank you very much, Jesse, for your interesting presentation. 
And now it's the turn of our third panelist. And it's my pleasure to present, to introduce Ana Mendez, uh, from the Department of History of the University of Pennsylvania. Ana Mendez received her first MA in History from the Universidad Federal do Paraná, Brazil, in 2009, when she dedicated herself to the study of sacred food in the Afro Brazilian religion, Candomblé. She received her second MA from the University of Maryland in 2020, where she developed research on liberated African women in Rio de Janeiro, analyzing the intersections among freedom, resistance, and domestic service. She started her PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania in 2020, where she intends to expand her research on gender and liberated Africans. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Anna, who's gonna present Teta de Nega, and the sweet taste of racism in Brazil. Thank you, Marco. Thank you uh, all for being here this morning. Um, I'm so happy to be here and share with you this project that I have in my drawer for many years. But first, I'd like to uh, highlight uh, Jonathan's use of Foucault in his pocket, which was very, very funny. And uh, so interesting because in a panel uh, about disrupting narratives, I think we have all our Foucaults in our pockets. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so because this is an uh, ongoing project, uh, instead of showing like a normal presentation with uh, developments and uh, conclusions, I'm, I'm going to show some ideas. Uh, so let's see if I can share my screen with you. Yes, I can. Let me know if you, can, you, if you can see it or not. I think you can. Uh, so as Michael told me, uh, I told you, my project is called Teta de Nega, the sweet taste of racism in Brazil. And this is a Teta de Nega. So uh, we can translate these words, Teta de Nega, uh, roughly as the breast of a black woman. But actually these words, um, don't capture the actual meaning of this, this, uh, this uh, the translation doesn't capture the meaning of these words. Theta is um, used to call the memory glands of an animal. And nega um, is the short version, the corrupt version of negra, which would be the polite uh, way of calling black people in Brazil, but nega can be either familiar, intimate, or pejorative. Um, so talking about this uh, sweet, this treat, um, this was very common when I was uh, a child. Um, it's composed by a thin uh, biscuit, a thin cookie, a marshmallow on the top, giving the shape and uh, covered by dark chocolate. Uh, it's not very common in like large supermarkets, but um, rather in um, street newsstands uh, or something similar. Um, and nowadays, um, it has been a while that I don't see it. Um, and it's also interesting to uh, tell you how this research started. Uh, because some research starts in the library looking for sources and anything. Uh, but this uh, project started in a conversation with some friends. Uh, and I was talking this crazy ide ideas about food and everything. Uh, and I, I mentioned that I thought Teta Ginega a very pejorative and, and heavy name for a treaty. And a friend told me, no, and I, I think you were going too far. Um, it's just a coincidence, right? Uh, it's covered by dark chocolate, so teta de nega. If it was white, it would be teta de branca. So I introduce you teta de branca. Uh, this uh, treat is also made of um, kind of meringue, um, but instead of a soft, and um, creamy texture as Teta de Nega has, this is more, this is baked. So 
it becomes dry and crumbly um, and, and it, it's not covered by dark chocolate and it's also not called Teta de Branca. It's called Suspiro. Uh, and Suspiro is uh, this deep breath and it, normally related to someone that is in love. So when we do like, ah, this is a Suspiro. And this is related to the lightness of the, the treat uh, instead of the color or anything else. So in this presentation, in this project, I would like to uh, reflect on some aspects. And uh, because I don't have this uh, project uh, fully formulated, I'd like to ask the audience to help me in two different forms. One way is to send me um, names of treats of your own country or from Brazil. I saw, I saw that there are some Brazilians in the audience. Um, that also has this racial component. So if you can send me, it will help me a lot. And also send me questions uh, challenging my ideas or um, questioning me because this is a way to, to further develop in this, this project. Uh, so I foresee to, to touch in some, uh, some of these aspects in this project. Appropriation of the black body. Uh, language, narrative, and imaginary. And I'm gonna get to this in, um, in the conclusions. Uh, so to start this reflection, I'm gonna read this uh, quote from Gilberto Freire's um, The Master and the Slaves. Um, in, in this part of the book, he is reflecting on um, the contributions of Black black people, enslaved people, African people, to the Brazilian um, white society and white family. Of the female slave, or mammy, who rocked us to sleep, who suckled us, who fed us, mashing our food with her own hands, the influence of the, woe of the old woman who told us our first tales of ghost and bishu, of the mulatto girl who relieved us of our first bishu de pé, of a pregnancy that was so enjo enjoyable, who initiated us into physical love and to the creaking of the canvas cot gave us our first complete sensation of being a man." End quote. So this uh, quote reveals uh, the Besides the horror, um, uh, relation between us versus them. That phrase uses to analyze connections between black people and white people, including himself in the us part that represents the white part patriarchal family, the group of the ones who had been fed, rocked, relieved from the itchiness of the biche de pé and initiated into sexual life, the exploitation of the work of black women. The author exposes his view on the intimacy and the docility of African slaves that live together with them. Crucially, Freire deals with mães pretas, black mothers, the wet nurses that not only breast fed white boys and girls, but also tenderly rocked them and facilitated the ingestions of food, mashing it with their subservient hands. For Freire, there was, and I quote him again, an alliance of Negro nurse and white child, of slave girl and young uh, mistress, of young master and slave lad, ended by doing away with this double character. For it was not possible to separate by the glass shards of the purists prejudice two forces that were in the habit of fraternizing so frequently and so intimately." End quote. In some, his ideas of harmonical uh, relationship between black and white people served as evidence to demonstrate that, that prejudice only existed in 
the minds of purists rather than in daily lives of Brazilian people. So Gilberto Freire is not talking about Teta de Negan, but he's talking about food. It's all about food. And it's all about who is feeding and who is being fed. Gilberto Freire is not talking about Teta de Negan, but his ideas of racial harmony prevails. In his book, Azúcar, we can find a recipe for suspiros but the, the, the white Teta Ginega that I showed in the beginning, but not for Teta Ginega or anything similar with another name. However, we find um, treaties referring to body parts of or actions. Not surprisingly, when this happened, it's never a body of a white person. While Teta Ginega is apparently an invention of the second half of the 20th century, at least with this name, we have examples of Beijos de Cabocla, the woman that's mixed race with uh, white people, white person and Indian person, uh, Pedi Muleki, um, that also appears, let me show you, in uh, other books. And this uh, treat refers to uh, Pe is foot and Muleki is uh, a slave boy, young boy. So this treat refers to the foot of a slave boy who could not wear um, um, a shoe and therefore is lumpy. Um, so we have this connection with the body again. Um, so in the Cero Nacional, a book from the 19th century, we have read this uh, recipe of Pej Muleki. And we have other um, examples in the Brazilian uh, recipe repertoire of um, other uh, sweets that are related to, to um, racial components. Five more minutes. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to conclude exactly with these five minutes. Um, so some conclusions that I got um, from this uh, really quick thought in this, in this uh, recipes from Brazil. First, that uh, when treats, uh, when we look at recipes that uh, have in their names, names of white people, they are generally, ref generally referring to ownership, authorship, and ownership. For example, cakes made in honor of the emperor or desserts, desserts created by someone or in the style of someone. When referring to black people, treat, re, treats, refer, treats refer to body parts, um, behavior, um, color. My second conclusion or my second um, idea is that um, I noticed that savory food rarely has this uh, racial component, at least in Brazil. I found some uh, racial, sav <laughs> savory food related to race in, in, in the US, for example, but not in Brazil. So um, it's the sweet part of the Brazilian recipe repertoire that carries this aspect of race. Um, maybe because it's, uh, easier to come from this uh, sweet part. It's more intimate or, I don't know, I have to think about that. But this is the, uh, that's, why, that's why I called my presentation the sweet taste of racism. Um, I don't think racism is sweet, never. Uh, it, racism is always bitter. Oh, sorry. Um, another conclusion is that the sweet narrative brings the language of domination. When eating Teta Ginega, we are metaphorically buying and consuming a black woman's body. And my last conclusion is that food justice for me is not only about a belly full of food, but um, the right of controlling the narrative the right of controlling food narrative. 
and Peter Ginega show us exactly who is narrating this story and who is feeding and who is being fed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. And I like to give virtual applauses. Uh, so thank you. Thank you to Anna, to Jesse and Jonathan for some brilliant uh, presentations in this panel. Now uh, we want to invite you to go to the Q&A section, uh, please, and ask questions to the panelists. We're gonna start with uh, one question uh, from um, Brita Anderson uh, for Jesse. Uh, Jesse, this question is for you. Do you believe that focus in the Chicano movement and in, it, and in this work on Asian indigenous cultures leaves out or essentializes the identities of contemporary at the time of the movement, uh, indigenous people? What are the costs and impacts of relying on imagery of an ancient indigenous past? Um, Desi, go ahead. Sorry, a little technical difficulty there. Um, I think that's an excellent question. And um, to answer it, uh, you'd also have to consider that during 1968, the American Indian movement was also happening uh, in conjunction with the um, farmers' rights movement, the Chicano movement, um, black civil rights movement. This was all happening at the same time. And Cesar Chavez said himself that he liked to work intimately with the American Indian movement uh, with his native brothers and sisters is what he said. Um, and so it was important to incorporate modern, uh, modern uh, Indians and uh, indigenous peoples during this movement. And the saying that these symbols are ancient is kind of incorrect. These ideas and these symbolisms um, still exist today. Um, the King Kunks and cross forms and the use of corn still exists. The modern uh, Huastecs in Veracruz, uh, Veracruz they, for a uh, yearly ritual, they create a cross made of corn, very similar to the one we see on the altar. Um, they utilize the same idea of kind of an, creating a, a cosmogram, an axis mundi with the ears of corn while also representing the Christ's crucifix. And so I wouldn't say it's really, um, it's really rooted in only uh, you know, ancient ideas. It's really more about the continuity of them about how they still exist today uh, into the 20th and 21st centuries rather, uh, rather than um, kind of discounting um, modern, modern natives and Indians in America. Does that answer the question? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Jesse. We have a comment from Dr. Merle Collins to Anna, how uh, your presentation is very interesting, how it's intersected with the end response to Gina Lisa's presentation yesterday. It seems to me to offer a theoretical perspective of some of what we heard as a creative presentation yesterday. So uh, can you reflect upon um, yesterday's uh, presentation, Anna, and also uh, I, I, I was also thinking about um, how Dr. Elise was saying, we are still thinking about food, it's always about food, and you're saying the same thing, but how do you understand with this theoretical framework the deconstruction of racism or the integration of racism and food and how we name things even, right? With the different conditions that you were talking, telling us about the suspiros and the teta do negra, how even the, their own composition, the physicality of the object is reflecting upon these two discussions. Yeah, uh, so I, when I prepared my presentation uh, some days ago, I it didn't have the words, it's all about food. Uh, it's about who, who is being fed. And of course I copied her, her, her words and it's, it was on purpose because it was so, so related. Um, and I agree with her uh, that when we think about food justice, we have to think about 
uh, who is feeding and who is being fed and who is left in be who is left behind of being fed um, in in all the aspects that we can. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, in uh, I think I have to investigate more is how she used this. Uh, uh, more creative and performative part to understand these um, these treats, these recipes from Brazil, uh, and how they are connected to racism. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, for example, I, uh, responding to Michael, another treat that we have a, a cake called Nega Maluca, so it's a, a crazy black lady. Um, so also related to this behavior and it's also has like chocolate sprinkles on top. It's black, of course. Uh, it has this chocolate sprinkles on top. So it refers to uh, the hair, the messy hair. So we, we and it, it's so normal for us. We don't, we don't stop to reflect on why the other cake that we have that also has like sprinkles, coconut sprinkles on top is not, <laughs> Branca Maluca, right? Uh, it's so rooted on our culture and, and so common that we don't stop to think about the meaning of the words there. And this, this is power, this is domination, right? We, when we think that this is not political, that the, this name is not political, it's a question of domination. It's a question of politics. It's a question of power, right? So we, we have to, to think about that. But yeah, I, I, I was like very emocionada, very touched by, by Gina and Ulysses presentation yesterday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for your response. And now we have a question from Jonathan uh, from Sabrina Gonzalez. Uh, it says, thank you for illuminating colonial power and racialized bodies into food consumption. Since your presentation finished there, I would like to hear how the revolutionaries imagine black consumption. Jonathan. Oh, hold on. Um, am I there? Yeah, I'm there. Um, yeah, so like that's a, that's sort of a topic that I want to explore a little bit further. Um, I can't speak very author authoritatively on that issue um, since I spent most of my time uh, with the, the colonial stuff. But um, I, th I think though that there's a potential for the revolutionary conceptions to possibly like illuminate a lot of other issues that uh, um, were not sort of uh, discussed. Um, first of all, like with emancipation, um, Sontanax and Poverel uh, uh, issuing emancipation, but that in order to be emancipated, slaves um, had to occupy one of two roles. Um, they either had to be soldiers or they had to be cultivators, right? So it's, there's this continuation and perpetuation of uh, these specific like military and economic roles. Um, and like during my, uh, uh, I, I had talked, I, I had taught a summer class uh, um, where I sort of also uh, Con contrasted this type of uh, idea of uh, citizenship with the type of citizenship that Kate Jarvis was talking about in revolutionary France. And I'm also wondering if a similar sort of dynamic um, also emerged, I'm, I'm not completely sure. And what Kate Jarvis was saying uh, was that she looked at, uh, uh, was it price controls um, known as the maximum um, that were instituted in, um, with the specter of famine in 1793 and looked at how women's groups reacted to that, right? So you had two different types of women's groups. You had like a working class artisanal, Les Dames des Halles, um, who resented price controls. 
And then you had the Société de Citoyens Revolutionnaires, like the, these were political club women who wanted to impose price controls. So I find that sort of dynamic to also be interesting because like what she ends up saying is it's that um, citizenship is also mediated through uh, economic uh, citizenship is then mediated through uh, gender relations. Um, and uh, that when the, uh, the revolutionaries uh, ended up closing women's clubs around the same time that they pr put these price controls on, um, that they had adopted a gendered language because women of the market were seen as disruptive, specifically actually the revolutionary women, not the market women, the dames des ales. Um, so I would be curious to uh, look more into that question. Um, so there's like questions of the gender that I'm interested in. There's questions of um, economic citizenship um, because again, the one of these two roles is a cultivator, right? And so slaves had to be constantly producers in some sort of way and tied to their, uh, well, free, I shouldn't say slaves, free citizens had to be tied to the land. And Toussaint Louverture does the same thing in 1800, where he uh, ties black bodies to the plantations in order to keep the plantation system going. Um, so there, but there's, there's also another sort of threat too, in which um, actually the first uh, emancipation decree that gets um, uh, passed in June by Sontanax um, also uh, is a weird one where it's male citizenship is tied to military service and being uh, military service. That's where all this stuff comes from. And then that men can emancipate women, but women can emancipate uh, men through marriage. So there's a gender uh, comport, uh, uh, component there too. Um, so if I was to continue this uh, research, I would look into how all that stuff played a role. Um, and then, um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Um, again, like I don't know much about food consumption uh, during um, the Haitian Revolution, I was just speculating that maybe there is this tie between um, like black bodies that have to, that colonial in administrators had to intervene to protect, right? So there's this assumption that blacks can't feed themselves. Um, and if you leave them unattended, that they won't feed themselves. Um, and that this distrust um, by colonial administrators um, and slave owners for uh, black consumption. I was wondering if that also is somehow related to these later notions of citizenship. Um, and, and it seems like that, right? Because like those forms of citizenship, either as military or uh, as, I mean, as a soldier or cultivator, assumes that you can't trust um, free blacks to actively to be active productive citizens um, and you have to mandate them to stay on the plantation in some sort of way um, so i hope that helps i mean that answers the question thank you so much jonathan for your answer uh, now we have uh, another question from um, sabrina gonzalez for uh, jesse considering women as community leaders uh, in the chicken eggs movement, where are women in art and politics in this story that you told us? In your research, do you look at women artists, women artists, indigenous women? If so, how is food and food practices depicted uh, differently? If not, what does it mean to look at food, arts, and politics in the absence of women? Well, I think that's an excellent question and one that definitely needs to be uh, addressed more in my research. Um, but for, in the continuity of the story I kind of laid out, uh, Chicana femi feminism hadn't really bloomed yet. That became a platform in 1969 through anecdotal reports I've read at the National Youth Conference, the same one they um, presented the um, Plan uh, Espiritual Plan de Atzlan 
if you're familiar with it. And that's when they first kind of started integrating uh, women on the platform of speaking out about their concerns during the movement. Um, Dolores Huerta was a major um, movement leader. She worked directly with Cesar Chavez um, during, and she was um, characterized as more outgoing and a, and a harder negotiator than Chavez actually. And she was part of the movement since 62. And she was a major, um, major uh, uh, women's leader at that time. Um, the, I, the Chicano feminism movement kind of was established concretely in 71 during a, um, a national Chicana conference that was in Houston, Texas. And so by the time this was being um, created in 67, these ideas weren't really um, thrown about and probably weren't very prevalent to um, artist Emmanuel Martinez. Um, and most of his artwork, um, like the ones I've seen, they're kind of shown in a domestic um, capacity dealing with um, fetching water or um, grinding maize for, for dough. Um, definitely not in the more active and warrior associated forms that Emmanuel Martinez depicts men in his artwork. Um, I have not looked at uh, a whole lot of uh, women artists during um, my research for this, and that's probably a shortcoming on my end because that is half of half of the movement is is women, and that's um, something that I need to address further in my research. So, what does it mean to look at the food, arts, and politics in the absence of women? Well, I mean, it's it means that you're not looking at the whole picture. It's like I said, you're missing half the picture, half of um, the population that is advocating, that is making art and is cooking food. Uh, women have a close association with, with food in the domestic lifestyle, historically and prehistorically. And I think during the 60s and 70s is when we start seeing um, women start in their own stride, start speaking out and becoming and forcing themselves into uh, traditionally patriarchal roles and um, <coughs> Sorry. And I think that's something that, again, I need to expand on in my research in general. Uh, that was a wonderful question. Thank you so much for asking it. Thank you for your answer, Jesse. And there's another question for you. Uh, for you. Um, Jackie is asking you, uh, what other food ceremonies exist besides corn? maybe cocoa, are, these, uh, are there any rituals and ceremonies? And I could add a little bit there because I was also thinking about the performative uh, nature of an altar that uh, we know that it's used for religious ceremonies, but here's this uh, syncretism between uh, traditional Western uh, religious ceremonies and also these festivities, these uh, ceremonies related to food. So uh, if, if you, during your research, do you find a performative use of this altar or a continuity in the use of altars for that? Well, performative use, I mean, it still exists during its, um, because I mean, performances, it's an interaction. It's, you know, it, again, like I said, it, it's a transformative altar space and just watching and interacting with it is kind of a performance in itself. And so the consecration that uh, for the Holy Communion that was held on it uh, in 1968, um, it still kind of pervades into the 21st century uh, is a major interaction between, you know, religion and the Chicano movement and farm workers rights. And that's all kind of culminates into a very activated um, altar space. And that can still be seen today. I mean, on an exhibition, you're, you're circling, it's a 3D piece, you're circling it, you're, you're investigating every panel, you're analyzing it. And that in its own way is kind of performance on your end. And it's kind of, again, it's an interaction and it intensifies and it intensifies the meanings of it because you're engaging with the artwork as you're uh, you know, walking around it. And in other ceremonies, um, I don't think it's ever been used ever again, uh, to my knowledge. Um, documentation on that artwork is very sparse. Um, I think it was in storage until the 90s, and then it was donated to the Smithsonian. Other ceremonies that, uh, that exist beyond corn and cocoa, cacao, um, I'm not familiar with a whole lot, to be honest. I do know dog, 
was a um, very ritualistic uh, meat. Um, the Aztecs, at least, they, they raised dogs for meat along with turkeys. And dogs were special ceremonies. I think it was either before wars or during uh, an equinox is when they would uh, ceremon ceremoniously um, gather dogs. I think they would paint them. They would uh, put them in the square and then they would ritually sacrifice them and butcher them um, for um, things like tamales. Uh, that they would eat for a, a major festival, uh, either celebrating uh, the oncoming of a war or the uh, changing of the seasons. And that's, hope that answers your questions, at least at some point. I think it does. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yessi. And Sabrina can tell us also in the chat if that um, answers. Uh, thank you so much, Jesse. We have uh, one last question from Brita to Anna. It says, Anna, if we're there with you today, what will we cook and eat together? Um, how do we read the act of consum consuming these racial threats, uh, racialized threats, and do you avoid them? Amazing questions. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> uh, so I think if we were together today, uh, we would cook, not me, but we together would cook a barbecue, uh, vegetarian and meat, everything, uh, for many reasons. One, well, we really, yeah, right? Um, also, I think it's related to slow burn, uh, not only because of the, the physical as aspect of the, the of the preparation, but also because it's something that uh, we do on the weekends when we have time and we can spend time together and we can slow burn this meal and this company and this uh, gathering um, and we can reflect on, the, on it. Uh, it's also the, the like typical dish of my region of Brazil. Um, so I, I think that's and then uh, we also cook, we also, we had already cooked this together. So I think I would love to repeat that. <laughs> um, from related to how do I read this consumption? I think one aspect that I didn't mention in my presentation is the economical aspect, right? We are consuming a product uh, in this is a trade, this is a deal, this is a business. Uh, so um, I, I had a slide that I didn't show, but I thought it was very interesting. So there is a similar treat in Colombia. Uh, it's called Beso de Negra, and it's the same composition. Um, and one of the companies that um, produce this treat is Nestlé. And recently, Nestlé uh, changed the name of the street. Uh, I don't know the, the other name that they're, they're going to give to the street, but uh, they are no longer they are no longer uh, selling the street with this name. So we also have to reflect on the economic part and who, uh, why we change names and why we preserve names, right? So if I consume or not, yes and no. Uh, as as I, I told in my presentation, um, this is part of uh, the Brazilian culture as well. So when I, ref when I reflect on it, of course I don't consume and I don't consume the idea. Uh, but for example, one thing that I cannot uh, let myself I cannot avoid saying is the the the, the title the, the title Nega Maluca. For me, the name of that cake is not chocolate cake; it's Nega Maluca, and this is this is bad. The, not, not that this is bad. This reflects on how in how rooted these words and and these um, expressions are on us. Uh, so we we have to to think about that and and how and why we. Are changing names and how and why these names were given.
Thank you so much, Anna. And let's let's come back all of us together to finalize the panel. So if everyone can turn out the cameras and for one last goodbye, <laughs> just for now. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think we can all agree with Lisa's uh, comment that we're gonna be thinking about these three very interesting presentations all day and also to reflect upon them through the continuity of our symposium. We're gonna take a 10, 13 minutes break to continue for uh, to our next panel. So stay with us and keep following us in Facebook, uh, YouTube and through Zoom. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
I'll take that as my cue. Buenos dias, bon dia, Ali Punja, good morning. Um, my name is Lisa Carney. I'm the postdoctoral associate at the Latin American Studies Center. And uh, last year I was a PhD student in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. So I, um, that explains my participation in the organization of this panel. I'd like to welcome you all to our 1130 panel, Feeding the Soul, Memories from the Earth. And I will be co-moderating this with my uh, compañera Daniela Bolansky, who is also from the Spanish department. We'd like to remind all of you um, that in during this presentation, uh, we will have at least one presenter speaking in Spanish. So if you would like to have an English language uh, interpretation, you can go to the bottom of your screen where it says interpretation, and you'll need to select the language that you want to hear. Um, you will probably also want to choose the mute original audio when somebody is presenting. So please do, uh, regardless of uh, whether or not you understand both languages, you'll need to choose one of those languages. All right, well, I will begin by just telling you a little bit about of our, um, our presenters today. We have Claudia Rojas, uh, Juliana Ravelli, and Marlene Orantes. And we are going to go ahead and let them get started. So uh, Daniela, take it away. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you to our panelists and welcome. Uh, so after our first panelist is Claudia Rojas. Claudia is a poet and a community advocate from El Salvador who lives in Virginia. Claudia is pursuing an MFA at the University of Maryland College Park. Her poetry appears in the Acentos Review, the Northern Virginia Review and elsewhere. Thank you, Claudia. Hello, hola, um, buenos dias. Good morning, everybody. I am really excited uh, to be here and to be the first one to start the panel. And um, as was graciously introduced, as, as I was graciously introduced, yes, my name is Claudia. Um, in English, is Claudia, Claudia Rojas. And I'm grateful to be part of this panel during Latinx Heritage Month. So I'm really excited about that. And I am a graduate student in the University of Maryland's MFA program. I'm studying poetry and I'm currently located because I know we're all located in different places. Uh, I'm actually in Falls Church, Virginia. This is where I grew up. And whenever I'm in a new space with new people, even if it's a Zoom space, um, I feel more comfortable beginning with a poem. So I'm going to start with a poem. Uh, this first poem is called Throwing Rice. How will you ever feed a husband? My mother is asking because I've been ruining the rice since age nine. There's no place in the kitchen for me or my failing hands. My mother is telling me to throw out the rice because my hands keep doing this kitchen thing wrong. I dump more rice in a steaming pot, the second rice pot to replace the one no one will eat. I pour the salt, grab the garlic, in goes the rice. I rid myself of the disappointment. Watch the rice I've dumped be consumed by the steam. There's no love in these hands. Not here, not now. I curse the garlic scent, the rice that disappoints mother, the hands that do not know how to slice a tomato right. Love escapes my hold whenever I enter the kitchen. I'm in the kitchen with my mother and I don't belong. You're not using your head. When will you do things right? Don't ask me into the kitchen. Beware my careless hands. I'm in the kitchen with my mother, not belonging. Hands tied by failure, out of place and out of the kitchen. Please don't ask me to try these careless hands or ask me to feed a husband when I won't. So Throwing Rice, which is a poem I just read, is a pantoum. So there's a lot of lines that repeat and it focuses on the gender culture expectations of women when it comes to cooking. Uh, and this poem was published in print this year in the Southwest Review. I'm going to read another poem as I close my presentation, but first 
I want to say some words before that. So I want to honor my heritage. I was born in El Salvador to a mother who lived through the entirety of the Salvadoran Civil War. I am a third generation Leo, so that means my mother and my grandmother and me, we were born in August and that the energy of fire, its passion and its warmth guides us and particularly me um, as I'm just learning to, um, to live in this like adulthood life. Uh, when I was born, my mother was a teenager and my father, though he was alive and he, and he is alive, um, he's been absent and did not raise me. So to be a single mother, it's been hard for my mom, um, whose own father wasn't part of her life. For um, my grandfather, which is her father, was killed when she was really young. And while food is the most sustaining to our bodies, for me, it's really been love that has sustained me the most. And I am eternally grateful to the mothers of the world, including Mother Earth. Uh, my mother has been working several jobs, starting since she was a teenager, uh, and her family, which is composed of seven other siblings, so I have a lot of aunts and uncles, um, they would often take the little money that she had made. And my mother was determined to live and determined to feed me. I have suffered injustices as a Latina, but having gone hungry is not one of them. Uh, in 2011, I started college at a private school in Massachusetts um, called Simon's Rock. And we couldn't afford the tuition. I knew the tuition was really high, but I didn't know what the numbers meant for my mother. Uh, my mother did not tell me until years later, but she ate salted tortillas, boiled eggs, or noodle soup while I place my food, uh, while I place food created by chefs onto plates in a dining hall. And whenever I am overwhelmed, which happens many times, I don't listen to my stomach. My first semester of college, my first and my first semester of graduate school, which was a year ago, I lost several pounds and only my mother could notice. She could see it on my face, but I could only see it by weighing myself. And you might be wondering what I think of my body, but I'll tell you. I do love my body. I love that I am woman and that my heart is an ocean. I love my collarbones and my hips and I love the curve of my smile. But my body is a round body and that means it is a working body. I live in the US through a humanitarian program called Temporary Protected Status TPS, which enables an immigrant to work legally in the US provided their country of origin is approved for TPS. Some of those designated TPS countries are Sudan, Haiti, Nepal, Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador. And I'm not going to get into the details about TPS, um, but it is something that I advocate for in my poetry and online. Um, I'll put this in the chat, but I have a website, claudiapoet.com, and I also uh, do a lot of advocacy about TPS on Instagram and Twitter. That's at Claudia Poet. So because of TPS, I have lived in virtual um, in perpetual anxiety thinking about my uncertain future because TPS operates under the assumption um, under the assumption that a person needs only temporary protection and Congress hasn't presented a permanent solution to the thousands of immigrants who are currently contributing to the U.S. economy. So with TPS, achieving my dreams has been bittersweet. When I was accepted to UMD last year, my acceptance letter asked about my work permit. So this has been the pattern of my life. In most workplaces and colleges I attend and have attended, I get this, we accept you, but did you know you're an immigrant? I want to read this last poem to honor the role that food plays in my life and the influences, uh, influences that food have in my, in my relationship with my mother. This last poem is called Nutrition. Because I've, because I've felt up the smooth spine of books with the caress of my book, and I've passed time under the hold of a good book, I know my mother. When I was seven, I learned about stone soup from hungry soldiers in an audiobook. And you wouldn't believe how the stomach thinks in hunger. My mother grew up and lived against a menu of hunger, and her Bible was the mountain peak to a pile of books. She stopped going to church, but she said to me, you have to believe. I was 15 the first time a pastor's preaching made my tears collect like soup in a falling bowl. I have seen my mother cry. Don't think that I've learned about my mother from the stuff and books 
It is the hunger for our history that has instilled a craving for soup, though I've also wanted the lives pictured in books. The characters in my books didn't keep time. Each time we would move, I must tell you, I packed my books first. I can never tell you what world we've known, except that my mother has a big family rooted in disjointed land and time. When I was two, my mother would go hungry so that I would have bread. We have bread and books. We have bread and books now. Each book is a vegetable soup brewing. When I was 10, my mother portioned soup. She would say, come eat. Books will not feed you. When I was 16, I saw the world within books and beneath my feet. When she was 16, my mother wanted the chickens to lay eggs. We were hungry. Don't you know, books belong to people with time. My mother would never say this. She's waited on time, waited for the soldiers to teach me about stone soup. I've picked up a different kind of hunger, a fistful of work. I don't know how time kisses you, mothers like you. I think of you, my mother, and the days we open the pages and library books. This is why in hunger, the world will taste to you like history, like our history. I keep canned soup in my mother's cabinet and, our, and in our home enough books. So this poem that I read is um, called De Sestina because it's a poem that repeats these six words, uh, which you may have caught on to. Those words were time, soup, hunger, you, mother, books. So those words are repeated. The poem has six stanzas. Uh, each stanza has six lines, and it's written after the folktale of Stone Soup, uh, which is a, a folktale that I came and I encountered it when I was really young. Um, this particular poem was published in the Bookends Review, and I just wanted to share those two poems. And thank you so much for allowing me this space and this time. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, I'd like to remind our audience that if you have questions for Claudia or any of our other panelists, you can type them in the Q&A box. Also, if you're just joining us, you uh, should ch click on the interpretation uh, button and select the language that you wish to uh, hear. It's my pleasure to introduce our next panelist, Juliana Hervelli. Um, Juliana Rovelli is a Brazilian writer and journalist. She is an MFA student in creative writing nonfiction at Columbia College, Chicago. In 2019, she received the Stories Matter One Foundation Award, which recognizes graduate students in the Chicago literary scene. In her works, Juliana investigates memory, family, identity, migration, and immigration. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, yeah, I moved. Uh, I want to thank the Latin American Study Center and all the people involved in the organization of this beautiful and extremely relevant uh, conference. It is a huge honor to be here speaking with you. I also want to thank Ana Mendes, my Brazilian friend, who encouraged, encouraged me to submit my piece to, to this conference. Obrigada, Ana. Uh, before I read an excerpt of my essay, I want to talk, talk a little bit about it. With love to the Sertão das Gerais, is a personal essay in which I reflect on the migration of my father from the Sertão of Minas Gerais in central Brazil to Sao Paulo in the 70s, and how his migration affected our relationship and myself as a person. This piece, however, is not only about migration and its effects, it's about many other things mainly about love. The first time I went to the Sertão, I was nine months old. I, of course, and unfortunately, don't remember that visit. 
but love is a strange, powerful, magical thing. I can clearly picture myself as a baby in my grandparents' house with walls made of clay and simple windows made of wood. In this essay published by the Quelli Journal, I bring some of my childhood memories about that place and connect them to one of the masterpieces of Brazilian literature, Grande Sertão Veredas by João Guimarães Rosa. In this process of investigation, the piece depicts the particular geography, fauna, and flora of the Sertão, which is part of the Cerrado biome. In my piece, Sertão and Cerrado are synonyms. My essay pays homage to the brave people that have roots in the Sertão, those who were born and lived there their whole lives, as my grandparents and many of my relatives, those who were born there and left to look for more opportunities, as my father, and those who have ancestry in that land as myself and my brother and now my beloved niece. It is also because of the courageous act of my father who left his father and the Sertão at 17 that I'm here in the United States talking to you. Obrigada a minha mãe e meu pai por todos os sacrifícios. The Cerrado, the savanna with the biggest biodiversity in the world, in the whole world, is one of the most endangered biomes in Brazil. It has been oppressed by the exp expansion of cattle and agriculture. In 2019 alone, the Cerrado lost 4,000 square kilo, kilo, kilometers of ve vegetation, almost the size of Delaware. I want to acknowledge the horrible setback that Brazil is facing right now, especially regarding environmental policies. Writing about the Cerrado and its people and evoking their history and stories is my personal expression of resistance. The Cerrado is a sacred land for me and many, many others. It is in the Cerrado where a huge part of my profound self is. If the Cerrado ends, all of us who have a connection with that place, we went to. As I wrote in my essay, Guimarães Rosa ends Grande Sertão Veredas with the infinity symbol. I truly hope that the existence of the Sertão will be endless. And now I'm go going to read my excerpt and in the end, I'm, I'm going to show you some pictures and this excerpt that I'm going to read now is about the jacaí, a species of stingless bees, very common in the Cerrado. With love to the Sertão das Gerais, an excerpt. About 15 years ago, my father came to me and said, Juliana and I have an idea. Pay, pay attention to my plan. I'll build a little box to bring some jacai from Minas. We will raise them in the backyard. I celebrated his idea with an EBA, the Portuguese version for yay. When my father came up with that, that idea, at no time did I question if his plan to bring little tiny bees to our house in the city 
was right or if there was any chance it would be successful. The idea of having Jatai in our backyard just made me so happy. I think mainly because my father was very happy that I wasn't able to see any problem with that. My father did build a little wooden box, made a tiny entrance where the bees would get in and out and painted it black to mimic a hole in a tree trunk. We generally went to Minas Gerais in the rainy season, December and January. The trip was probably our last time on my grandparents' small farm. My grandfather had already passed away, but my grandmother still lived there. One day, my father spent hours in the backwoods by himself. He didn't invite me to his expedition, making it clear that the Jatai plan was more his than ours. But I saw him coming back from the woods, holding that black box with both, both arms. I saw this scene because I probably spent the whole time waiting for him. Juliana, ven ver. Juliana, come see, he said. There they were, those gentle, tiny bees. Some days later, we drove 900 miles back to Sao Paulo with the black box inside the trunk of the car. At our house, he suspended the small container in the corner of the cemented backyard, hoping the bees would get used to the new place and feel at home. I loved going to our backyard to see the Jatai coming in and out their wooden house. I was pr proud of them venturing in the big city. My father was glad to. On the weekends, he climbed on a stool to watch his hive working. My father and bees share a tireless commitment to work, but I don't, I don't think it is about loving it. What they have instead is a huge awareness of duty. Once joyful, my father called me to show what seemed to be a miracle. He opened the top of the box and pointed. Olha, look, there was honey. We were both thrilled. Jatai is one of the most common species of stingless bees in Brazil. Aside from the woods, they adapted themselves to live in the cities where they frequently build hives in the walls. That is why it wouldn't be impossible for them to, to thrive at our house. And for about a year, my father's bees endured. But he, but he was really sad when little by little they disappeared. He believes that the fumigation trucks that circulate to, to kill the Zika virus mosquitoes also killed his Jatai. Every once in a while, he still talks about it. I too was devastated that no one else lived in the black wooden box anymore. But maybe it wasn't the fumigation. Maybe they missed the Cerrado and went back home. Today, I think that I should have prevented my father from bringing the bees, that I should have realized that they wouldn't adapt to our house. They belong, they belong to the Sertão, and that is a sacred thing. At the same time, I understand my father's wish to bring a little piece, something so precious from his original home. If I could, and if the Sertão allowed me, 
maybe I would also bring Jatai to the United States, where I live now. But I know they wouldn't be happy here. They would also leave, disappear, trying to go back to their home. Thank you. I'm going to just to share. I'm going to share with you three pictures. I hope you can see. So this is the Urukuya River, Uhi Urukuya. And uh, this is a picture that I, I took myself in uh, 2010. And it's very close to my relative's house in this in the city um, where most, where a big part of my family is right now. So, and the Urukuya River is also in the Grand Circumveredas, the book uh, uh, by Guimarães Rosa. And in the book, Guimarães Rosa called call the Urukuya River as the book, the river of love. And this is the small farm that belonged to my grandparents. Now it is the home of my cousins. Um, and this picture, my mom took this picture in 2018. And the certain shines, always. And the last one, these are my grandparents in the same place uh, and my brother and I, when we were kids. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Juliana, for your presentation. So our next panelist is Marlene L. Orantes from UMD. Um, Marlene works with the University of Maryland Extension as an expanded food and nutrition education program educator in Montgomery County. She's from El Salvador and she graduated from the Evangelical University of El Salvador as a physician. She has lived in, U in the USA since 2000. She has been married for 24 years and she's a mother of three children. <laughs> She's also a teacher who connects people with pride and joy to their own healthy foods and tradition. And today she's going to present uh, gastronomy in USA, a culinary cultures salad in a single dish. Thank you, Marlon. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I uh, share my screen? Sure. Buenas tardes y muchas gracias a el Centro de Estudios de Latinoamérica en la Universidad de Maryland por esta oportunidad que tengo de presentar este tema, una ensalada de culturas en un solo plato. Eh, también mis agradecimientos a mi mentora, a Dr. Mira Meta, quien es la directora del programa Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program. El contenido de mi presentación es una introducción, eh, la estadística, influencia de nuestra gastronomía, el impacto culinario de las Américas en Estados Unidos y un resumen. La importancia uh, de nuestra comida, del, de nuestra comida para los latinos. Todas las culturas en general giran alrededor de la cocina y el comedor. Latinoamérica no es la excepción. Y sus deliciosas recetas como, por ejemplo, un buen taco, una buena pupusa o un tamal de pollo o una deliciosa arepa han sido y seguirán siendo testigos de los más grandes momentos familiares que se viven en nuestro comedor. ¿Quién nos recuerda los consejos y normas de etiqueta que nos enseñaron en nuestra mesa nuestros padres o nuestros abuelitos? como sentarse derechito en la silla, no hablar con la boca llena de comida o comer o correr la silla 
para las damas para que se sienten, no poner los codos sobre la mesa o cuando nos decían que no es correcto tocarse la cara o el pelo mientras comemos, también el no chuparse los dedos por más deliciosa que está la comida, grandes recuerdos se dan alrededor de la comida. Grandes anuncios se dan también alrededor de la comida. Me voy a casar, voy a tener un bebé. Me aceptaron en la universidad, pasé la materia. Mi novio me dio el anillo de compromiso. Afortunadamente, muchos de nuestros hogares latinos mantenemos nuestras tradiciones al comer juntos, como familia, y saborear estos platillos deliciosos, además de fortalecer nuestros lazos familiares. Me encantaría hablar acerca de la estadística de los latinos y aunque a algunos no les gusta la idea de que Estados Unidos de América sea un país de migrantes, este es un país en la suma de muchas culturas y eso incluye los hábitos alimenticios y la gastronomía latinoamericana. De acuerdo con el Centro de Investigación Pew, la población latina de los Estados Unidos es aproximadamente un 18% de los habitantes en este país. Y de seguro vamos a hacer más ahora en el censo del de 2020. Actualmente la población de latinos somos más de 60 millones de habitantes para el 2019. De acuerdo con el sitio web abasto.com, Hablando solamente de la comida mexicana como referencia en marzo primero del 2018, dice um, que según las cifras recopiladas, el centro de los Estados Unidos y del Simon National Consumer Survey, más de 110 millones de estadounidenses, ¿saben qué? Consumieron tortillas en el 2017. Ahora en el 2020 me imagino que son más. Asimismo, el número de restaurantes mexicanos en todo el país alcanzó una cifra de aproximadamente más del 59 mil eh, 59, establecimientos a, a mediados del primer trimestre del año pasado y los que tienen un menú mexicano representan aproximadamente el 9% de todos los restaurantes en Estados Unidos según los datos de la firma del servicio de las comidas del CDH Expert. La influencia de la gastronomía latina en esta sociedad es grande y se refleja incluso en los grandes eventos de este país, como por ejemplo el Día de Acción de Gracias, la Navidad o las celebraciones de fin de año. De acuerdo a la página del Internet, del chef Aaron, wearecocina.com, hoy, este mes, celebramos nuestra herencia hispana, pero al mismo tiempo estamos celebrando la cocina latina por su riqueza, tanto cultural como en el sabor. Para muchos, quizá la comida es más que un combustible, representa la identidad del lugar que para muchos latinos es lo que más nos une, nuestras raíces. La comida latina es sabores complejos en una forma sencilla. Una de las ventajas de la, de la cocina latina es la sencillez fundamental de la mayoría de los platos. Se logra una gran variedad de sabores, colores, texturas, utilizando en la mayoría de los casos los mismos ingredientes bien básicos. La influencia de la comida latinoamericana no ha llegado solo a este país, sino que al mundo entero y viaja muy rápido. Hablar de la gastronomía latina es hablar de mucho sabor, de mucho color, de mucho olor y de mucha textura. Fue muy interesante ver en un reportaje de Deutsche Welle, un canal de televisión alemana, que un restaurante en Europa se ha especializado en vender hamburguesas de aguacate. Incluso el aguacate hoy se le llama el oro verde por su adaptación mundial. 
Por cierto, ¿sabías lo que significa aguacate? Pues bien, el aguacate viene del náhuatl aguacal, que significa testículo, y aguat que significa o se refiere a un árbol. Entonces, la traducción literal sería árbol de testículo. Recordemos que el náhuatl era un idioma de Mesoamérica, el actual hoy México y Centroamérica. Usted, así como yo, podemos encontrar restaurantes latinos en cada pueblito de este país. Tuvimos una salida con mi familia y fuimos a Ohio, en una zona rural de Columbus, cerca de Lima, de Lima rumbo a Toledo, en un pueblo llamado San Mary. ¿Y saben qué? Encontramos un restaurante mexicano. Eso fue como un oasis en medio de otra cultura. En la foto inferior podemos ver Scarlet, que es el restaurante que encontramos, y le tomé foto. Y también en la parte superior está un restaurante que se llama Pico Taco, que lo encontré en la Columbia Road, aquí en Washington, D.C. Entonces, ahora quisiera hablar un poco más acerca de la gastronomía en Estados Unidos y cómo es que nosotros tenemos esta influencia. La fama de la comida latina se ha expandido más allá de los tacos. Hoy se incluyen las pupusas, las empanadas, el chimichurris y otros platillos favoritos latinos como el ceviche peruano o el churrasco argentino. Nuestra comida se ha convertido en una favorita en este país y no solo para los clientes hispanos, sino que también para la población estadounidense. La única preocupación con nuestra herencia culinaria es que a medida que las influencias latinas viajan más lejos desde su punto de origen, se diluyen y se pierde su autenticidad. Pero si llega a manos correctas, los ingredientes y las técnicas se mantendrán la herencia de donde se origina. Yo quiero mostrarles aquí algunos ejemplos de cómo nuestra gastronomía está influenciando los Estados Unidos. Las ventas de salsa de tomate latina exceden las ventas de ketchup en Estados Unidos. Las tortillitas o los nachos y la salsa se han llegado a ser una merienda estadounidense principal. Algunos platillos latinos se, se han americanizado, como por ejemplo las enchiladas, la sopa de frijoles, los chiles rellenos, los burritos o las tortas o sándwiches cubanos. Y también hay algunas bebidas que los estadounidenses adoran beber, como por ejemplo las bebidas de frutas como el mango, la piña y las bebidas no dejando atrás, otras que incluimos una buena margarita, un gran tequila o quizás un mojito cubano. Después de la comida estadounidense, como las hamburguesas o el hot dog y la comida italiana, como la, la, pasa, la pasta o la pizza, la comida latina es considerada la tercera más popular de los Estados Unidos. Quisiera también hablar acerca de lo que es la gastronomía hispana a lo largo de las Américas. Veamos la importancia del impacto de la gastronomía de todas las Américas a partir de México. Suponer que la cocina hispana es solamente la cocina mexicana, eso es una concepción falsa. No todos los hispanos comemos tacos, frijoles o maíz. Si bien los alimentos pueden ser populares en México, no se consideran alimentos básicos en otros países hispanos o latinos. Le voy a dar algunos ejemplos. Por ejemplo, en México, la comida mexicana aquí en los Estados Unidos es la comida hispana número uno. Las comidas populares de ellos que están influenciando en Estados Unidos son los tacos, los burritos, las quesadillas y depende de la cocina mexicana, depende de la diversidad según el, la región de México. 
Pero una cosa, de una cosa estamos seguros y hay que recordar de que la mayoría de la comida mexicana es picante. De acuerdo a la influencia de la comida gastronómica de Centroamérica, la mayoría de, nos, de, de nuestros platos, incluyéndome yo, porque soy salvadoreña con mucho orgullo, incluimos el pollo, el cerdo, los chorizos y los frijoles rojos y el arroz blanco no deben quedar atrás. Los alimentos básicos son tortillas, yucas, los tamales, eh, el chicharrón con la yuca frita y algunas baleadas y pueden haber acompañamientos típicos que incluyen frutas tropicales con mango, papaya y tamarindo. Dentro de lo que es la influencia que impacta dentro de los Estados Unidos del Caribe, tenemos a varios países como Cuba, Puerto Rico y República Dominicana. En esto ellos, eh, los alimentos más básicos son los productos de mar en comparación de otros países hispanos. El ajo y las hierbas, como por ejemplo el cilantro, se utilizan mucho para dar sabor a sus alimentos. Y en especial el frijol negro es el más prominente en estos platos. Ahora, la importancia de la influencia o del impacto de América del Sur, me gustaría dividir eh, en la América del Sur en dos regiones, el norte y el sur. Dentro de los países del norte de Sudamérica, está Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Perú, componen esta región. En Perú y en Ecuador tienen una amplia cocina marinera, especialmente en las zonas costeras. El ceviche es probablemente el, el platillo de marisco más conocido. En Venezuela y en Colombia, las arepas. En Perú y en Ecuador, como dije, hay una gran variedad de papas. Y recordemos que la bandeja paisa de Colombia y la papa a la guancaína de Perú son los alimentos básicos. En cuanto a los países de América del Sur, en el área sur, de esta región comprenden Chile, Argentina, Paraguay y Uruguay. En Argentina y en Uruguay se pueden encontrar innumerables variedades de carnes y sus derivados. La carne de res se considera como un alimento básico de estos países. Y no olvidemos la parrilla argentina o la brasileña. Como dije antes, cinco minutos la más. Se centra generalmente alrededor de la comida, pero hay que recordar que nos encanta comer mucho. En nuestros países quizás esto no sea el problema, porque la gente es más activa, pero llegando a la industrialización hacen que la actividad física ya no sea tan extenuante como lo era para nuestros padres o abuelos. Este comer mucho puede que sea un problema en este país con la obesidad y hay problemas derivados de mucho de muchos de nuestra comunidad nos estamos adaptando a comer en porciones adecuadas. De acuerdo a mi experiencia en el departamento de Spanish Food and Nutrition Education Program, nuestra comunidad latina siempre ha demostrado que consumimos e incorporamos frutas y verduras en nuestras comidas. Esto es realmente muy positivo y con muy poca educación nuestra gente disminuye los riesgos de las enfermedades crónicas. Bueno, en resumen y para terminar, Hemos tratado la importancia de la comida de la familia latina, su impacto cultural y su fortalecimiento en las relaciones afectivas para quienes se sientan a comer en familia. Este país es capaz de absorber buenas cosas de quienes llegan a formar parte de su sociedad. Y como latinos estamos teniendo un gran impacto no solo en el área laboral, sino que también en nuestra gastronomía. Con esta emergencia sanitaria sin precedente, la nueva modalidad o normalidad llega con un distanciamiento social, pero no en nuestros corazones ni en nuestro apetito, usando una mascarilla, pero con una gran sonrisa detrás de ella, con mucha incertidumbre en nuestro alrededor, pero con esperanza y fe en nuestro futuro, con posibilidad de pérdidas, pero con opciones de recuperarnos. Somos latinos, estamos aportando no solo el, con el trabajo y con nuestra gastronomía que han llegado para quedarse, sino que con expectativas de crecer y de seguir aportando. Así, por favor, apoyémonos como hermanos 
demos lo mejor y mostremos o demostremos que todos somos una gran familia. Dios bendiga a todos los pueblos del mundo y bendiga a esta patria que nos abrió sus brazos para quedarnos. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Marlene. Uh, at this time, I would like to invite all of our panelists to uh, turn on their screens. We have time if any of the panelists would like to add anything, if you felt you didn't get to say something or something came into your... Uh, we'd like to invite everyone to post your questions in the question and answer box. I have a couple of comments here. Ana Menda said, she, Lindo Claudia, and it was interesting to see this layer of food, family, and memory. Um, I think that was for Juliana. Lynette Martinez Garcia says, eh, ¿Qué otras desventajas tiene la divulgación de la comida hispana en otros países? Por ejemplo, el impacto ambiental que estamos teniendo en México por el plantío masivo de aguacates, por la demanda mundial. Simplemente el 85% se importa a Estados Unidos. Yo pienso que uh, voy a tomar esa, esa, esa pregunta. Ya ayer estaba viendo un reportaje de, um, de esto específicamente no es solamente en México, sino que también en Europa. Que en Chile también, en Sudamérica, que es, es, eh, están quedando las tierras um, secas y es por la plantación de la falta, como se le llama en, ese, en esa área, o del aguacate. Pero um, es, uh, es, es, es el, el ambiente, el, 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 ¿cómo se llama? El, el daño ambiental es grande. Con tal de vender y de plantar aguacates, ciertísimamente, por eso se le llama el oro verde, pero está haciendo un daño ambiental. Yo creo que eh, nuestros gobiernos eh, deberían de regular esas plantaciones y de tener un poquito más de leyes para eso. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, gracias, Marlene. And I want to invite Juliana, Claudia, Marlene, if you want to add and to or to share uh, something more with us. That would be great. Yeah, maybe maybe I can just uh, add that um, there are so many things to say about food and the Sahadu and the Sertão. And I, I included some things in this essay, but actually I need to write another one because food is a huge part of the culture also in the Sahadu. And Marlene just mentioned the Oro Verde. And in the Sahadu, we have the gold of the Sahadu, which is the Piqui. So Piqui is a fruit uh, that we we just find in the Cerrado and my father just my mother too but my father loves piqui and it's very precious for us that's why it's called not only for for, for us for my family but it is sacred for many indigenous people in the Cerrado that's why it's called the gold of the Cerrado piqui and we have a huge uh, connection with cassava, with manioc, mandioca. It's really important for us to, so there's a lot of things to, to say about food and the sahara. And I would add um, just the importance of making your own food and the importance of family recipes, having 
um, a tradition that a parent makes or that even you make and then you pass it down um, to a family member or a friend. I think, um, I, and someone mentioned this too, you know, we, we remember things through food uh, and our memories and whenever we like celebrate events, it's around food. So just thinking about how we can make memories by making our own food, um, thinking about our own gardens, uh, but also just the ability to know that you touched your food first, uh, particularly right now with the pandemic, thinking about where your food is coming from and how you're making your food is something that I, I just wanted to note. Um, and I just wanted to, again, express my gratitude for um, being present here today and listening to the stories that the panelists have shared. I want to um, add also um, about Juliana's presentation when she speak about the love. When we, as a Latino community, when we cook all the time, another ingredient that we put into our food is the love. How you cook, many ingredients can be inside or whatever um, the recipe is, but you need to put a little love and then the food tastes different. So <laughs> it is, is, it's really amazing to see how um, our gastronomy is, is part of this uh, culture right now. And then, um, but either way, when you put the love, as Juliana said, it's totally different. For this reason, in our department as expanding food and nutrition education program as an educator, I'm all the time encourage my participant to put in, to continue to put in the love in every recipe. And if they can change a little bit other ingredient that is not available in this country, maybe it can be a little different um, the recipe, but um, with the, the flavor of love everything changed. Thank you. We have a couple more questions from the chat. Um, I have one here that's directed at Juliana, but I think any of you could respond to it in your own communities. The question is, how does the Brazilian, reg how does Brazilian regional food contribute to or reinforce local identities and pride inside the communities? Yeah, sure, this is a great question. Yeah, you know, in Brazil, everything is about food. <laughs> we, yeah, everything is about food. And most of my, my most beautiful and lo loving uh, memories are around food and women and the women in my family cooking for me, you know? We went to, because we went to Minas, well, only once a year in general my grandmother and my aunts they were always trying to cook for us everything we loved and what Marlene just said is so beautiful just <laughs> make me so moved because even here in the US you know my my husband and I are always saying you know, this food, when the food is good, we say the food they made with love mm -hmm. every time, you know? And yeah, so it's food is really, really important for the, uh, the resistance and the uh, survival of so many uh, regional communities in Brazil, but not only in Brazil, right? In Latin America. It's true. The food is, 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 is something very important in our families, in our reunions, with family, with friends. Um, it, it's very important. Uh, it doesn't matter, it just can be rice and beans, but if you can serve with hospitality, it would be great. And, and, and certainly it's very simple our recipe are very simple when I'm educating my community. 
um, is just to change a little bit. And then this is my experience is, is to change a little bit of the ingredients, but they taste great, especially when we are together. It, it, it's not the same when you are alone, eating alone, it's good to be together. And I want to just say, I know we keep um, repeating this thing about love being an ingredient. Um, my first poem was about, you know, I had the instructions to make rice when I was very young, but I didn't have the heart and the, like, the actual energy to be thinking, oh, somebody's going to eat this food um, and somebody will, will be very glad that they ate this food. So very young, I didn't understand this ingredient of love because I didn't have that within me. Um, I'm still learning because I have a mom who's like, she doesn't really follow um, something that's written like a paper recipe. Like I do, I have to, but for her, like she has done this so many times, practiced so many times. And every time is she is coming to the kitchen and she is just very careful with everything. She knows where to place each uh, ingredient. Uh, she knows which pots and pans she likes to use over the others. But for me, like I go into the kitchen and it's like, what am I looking at? I don't even know what, like what's in the kitchen. Um, so like I'm thinking about this ingredient of love, which is more to me, it's like more of really thinking um, how you've made this in the past, how is it has been made previously. Um, and then I think, yeah, we do, we can add something a little different. Um, but I just wanted to share that for, for example, for my mom, uh, she's always wanted to make pupusas, which are you know, like the staple for Salvadorians. And she's had a hard time because she was just really stressing about like, how do you make it now that she's in El Salvador? Uh, and I have an aunt who has a restaurant in El Salvador and like she makes it really easy. She's done it so many times. Um, and she really found out it was just like there was a cheese ingredient, like there was a particular cheese she has to use. And now that she's found it, like she's just making it all the time. But she also doesn't have this anxiety of like, what is the thing that is missing? So it's like two things, you know, like finding the right ingredients, but then also like coming to the mindset that um, I'm going to practice how to make this and I'm not going to worry too much. So that's something that I want to share. Like my relationship with food is a, like, very complicated in that way of like, I, um, I'm still searching for like, this is going to be something for myself, but then also like, I want to pass this down to um, family or friends, not something like, um, like for me, it's been passed down, like you have to make this food, like for your husband, um, or even like we might see this in telenovelas or books, you know, like um, the way to a man's heart is the food. But for me, like that's not the mindset that I need. Like for me, it's like, no, like the way for your own heart and you to be alive is making food with joy. Um, so like in addition to love, also joy. I wanted to share a couple of those things. Thank you. So um, our next question, uh, so Ana Mendes says, if Juliana, Juliana wants to expand on it, how does animal studies influence your thought when writing this essay? Well, Ana, great question. You know, I don't know, so many things influenced, influenced my my writing, um, I do a lot of research, a lot of research. I'm, I'm obsessed with research. Um, so I research a lot about, for instance, Jatai, which is the bee, the this is species of singless bees. The native species of bees in Brazil, they are all, they don't have things they are stingless all of them so yeah i don't know there are so I, I think there are so many other things to 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 say about it yeah i don't know <laughs> I need to, because what is interesting about writing creative writing pieces, right, is that we, we, other people see our influences sometimes that we don't see. 
and this is so interesting so amazing so yeah i don't know if i answer answered your question but Oh, and Anna said, no, no pressure. She's just curious about the process to respond to that. Um, let's see, we do have about 15 minutes left and we have gotten quite a few more uh, questions and comments in this time. So we'll try to get through them. Um, I have a question from L Laura Corpeño. She's asking about what ways your health has changed while changing diets for the United States because Many of the ingredients from Latin American food are not there. Sometimes they're very expensive. So have you had experiences with that? Well, first of all, um, certainly um, food from Latino America is so difficult to find here in different grocery stores, but you can find, you can uh, see different um, in different store, the point is that it's so expensive. Those grocery stores from our community is always so expensive. So um, maybe they can change the ingredients from different recipes, but at the end could be the same nutrients and it's supposed to know that all the ingredients can affect your health. So if you, for example, in my experience with our program in our communities, I give some recipe, for example, salsa. You need to put tomato, cilantro, uh, onions, peppers, and um, with tortillas. If you don't find, uh, and add frijoles or beans, red, if you want. But if you want frijoles negros, you can find uh, frijoles negros at the end. The same um, are the same beans are different just by the color, but didn't affect your health. And I think that this is the um, the point that we are doing in our program to educate and continue to educate to all people. To be better and in, in knowing the diet is mostly in the physical activity because our community is not the same in our countries from where we are uh, origin. Why? Because in our countries, as I, as, as I explained in, in my presentation, uh, we walk, we do physical activity, and here we have different commodities, like uh, we have a car, uh, we have four season in our country, just we have two season, the season of rain and the season of dry. So it's a little different, uh, but it's not a diet, it's logical, it's for the physical activity. And I'm encouraged to my community to do that. And, and certainly uh, some ingredient is a little more expensive from our countries here in the United States, but you, you can find that. I don't know if Laura, I, I can um, really answer my question, your question. Um, now I am going to read some comments from um, Andrea Alexandra Corpeño López, and in Spanish, excelentes e interesantes ponencias, en especial felicitar a la doctora Orantes por esa completa recopilación de datos relacionados a nuestra gastronomía latina, lo cual me hizo recordar lazos familiares, especialmente en estos momentos tan difíciles que vivimos. Buen trabajo. Um, También otro, uh, one more comment, um, all I could think about is the book Como Agua para Chocolate, Emotions Manifesting Through Cooking. Um, and now I have one more question to Juliana, 
Do you think that your father's courage inspired you to move from Brazil to the USA? Yeah, actually, it 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 didn't inspire me because uh, the migration of my father had a lot of effects on myself, you know, and or it is painful. It is very painful, and we are very attached to to each other. So it was, in fact, I think the courageous act of my father, the migration of my father inspired me to always do my best and not take for granted my opportunities because, because of the migration of my father to the region where I was born in the metropolitan area of Sao Paulo. I'm very privileged now, you know, and I had to, I'm a first generation going to college. Um, so, but it, it, it had a price. It had a huge price and I know the price of the migration. So when I came to the US, it was also pain, very, very, very painful. And also maybe because Maybe because I, I knew the experience of my father being uh, far away from his father because, uh, yeah, and his family. You know, I, I say in my essay that my father shines in the Cerrado. And I always saw that. I always saw that my father, he shines a lot and the Cerrado and not so much in the city, you know? And this always affected me in many ways. So yeah, I the migration of my father and also my, my mom is also a, a migrant, He but she, she came from the countryside of Sao Paulo to the city when she was a kid with her family. You know, all these migrations and yeah, they made me to, to not take for granted my education and my opportunities. Thank you. Uh, we just wanted to remind the audience um, to type in your questions in the Q&A box. We only have about seven minutes left. And if you asked a question, if you typed a question and you we haven't answered it, please feel free to retype it. We um, are on, on our screens, the questions jump around a little bit. So if, if we haven't gotten to your question, please let us know. Um, I have another question for Juliana. What is the importance of talking about the uh, Cejado at a time when burning in the Pantanal increases? Um, yeah, so this is so, so, it, it is so, so important. Uh, Marilla, thank you for this question. It is, you know, the fires and also I've been seeing the whole uh, destruction process in the Cerrado since I was a kid. Right, this is not new. But things, you know, some things were improving, some things weren't improving, but now, right now, with this government, we are all facing, Brazil is facing a huge set, uh, setback in so many ways. And yeah, as I said, this is, I'm, I'm talking not as the voice of, my, of the people from the Cerrado, because I'm not, you know, I, I'm just one person, they have the, their own voices. But I want to always talk about my family uh, stories or histories, and my family is, is one of my main obsessions, because in literature in Brazil, you know, we know the 
For instance, João Guimarães Rosa wrote Grande Sertão Veredas, which, by the way, will have a translation to English, a new translation next, next year, probably. And I'm very excited about it. But we don't see many people from the Cerrado talking about the Cerrado. This has been changing, right? Especially with uh, indigenous uh, activists and wonderful uh, people. There's, uh, for instance, Celia Chakriaba, and Celia Chakriaba is a wonderful uh, Chakriaba woman who is always talking about the Cerrado, always fighting about the Cerrado, and always showing how the Cerrado has been, you know, destroyed. So yeah, it, it is important. We, we need more people, not only me, but we, we, we really need m much more people talking about not only the Cerrado, but, but, but about regional communities in Brazil, not only in Brazil. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have some more minutes. We would like to invite Marlene, Claudia, and Juliana, maybe one minute to, to share one something more with us to, to close this panel. I just want to um, add uh, one more thing in is, um, as a community, as a Latino community, we need to continue to empower our brother and sister to continue to support this beautiful country to be the best, to continue to, um, to work very hard in whatever situation that you are, in whatever face, uh, um, whatever, um, challenge that you have, remember that we are resilient and remember that we have a great heart to share with others, especially in this country. And also I'm very thankful with um, Latin um, Study Center that give me this opportunity to be presenter. And as I said to my uh, mentor and director of our program that uh, encouraged me to submit my abstract, um, Dr. Mirameta, and thank you to all of you to put in attention and listen to my presentation. Thank you so much, and hope that uh, something we can learn from my presentation also. Oh, I can go. Um, so I, I just wanted to do um, emphasize again the importance of sharing uh, what you heard about today. And even if you've attended other panels or will attend another panel, sharing what you've learned today or the ideas that you engage with on social media. So the hashtag for this uh, conference is Low Burn Conference. Um, you can follow me at ClaudiaPoe.com and I'm at Instagram and Twitter, Claudia Poet. So, um, I think right now there's so many things that are competing for our attention. So if you find something just in your everyday that really resonated with you, um, whether it's this conference or something else, you come across a story, an article you read online, um, a video, share that with your friends, share that with your neighbor. Right now, a lot of us are at home and you know we keep operating as if this is like, what we were supposed to do, going to work, um, doing everything online, but this is not natural and this is not how we operate. So staying in touch with friends online, but also um, through calls and texts and sharing about your day. Like this is something um, that I paid attention today. Today I heard a poet, today I heard uh, Juliana talk about Brazil and she shared her story or Merlin talk about pupusas and you know all of this. 
So do share that. Don't just keep these stories within yourself. And that's one thing that I want to emphasize as a community advocate and a poet, this idea of sharing what you come across. Like, just don't let it go. So sharing that and trying to stay connected in these different ways while we are living in, in a natural way right now. Yeah, I just want to thank you all. Thank you so much, Claudia. Thank you so much, Marlene, Daniela, Lisa. Thank you so much, the Latin American Studies Center, uh, Anna. And I also want to thank my whole family. You know, my, my huge obsession is my family, my, my maternal and my paternal families. And I want to thank my husband. I want to thank also my parents who made so many sacrifices so I could be here. And I want to thank my brother and my sister-in-law and my niece, uh, who is nine months now. And I miss them so much. I miss Brazil so much every day. And thank you so much, my, my friends, too, who are always supporting me. And, you know, Marlene said something about resilience, about being resilient. And I think that's, that's one of the things, one of the major things that I, I learned with my father and my grandparents and my relatives in in the Cerrado. They are very, very resilient because it is not easy to live there. And so now I'm here in the US and I know that I'm part of them because I know that I'm resilient to, to be here in the US at this time and at this difficult time. And I want to honor all my ancestors. So I, I'm so grateful to, to have the roots that I have. And I'm going to post on the chat the link for the whole essay if you want to read and my contacts. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you to our panelists. These are really wonderful presentations and we'd like to thank Everyone who has been, um, all of our attendees, thank you for all of your great questions. We are now going to take a break from 12.45 to 1.30. Um, it's a great time to take these ideas and really ponder them over, really chew them over while you're eating your lunch, right? Um, and we'd like to remind you that at 1.30, we will have a film screening of Raspando Coco, followed by a Q&A with the director, uh, Dr. Pilar Egues Guevara. So please join us. And to, um, to repeat what uh, one of our panelists said, please go out and tell people, come join us. We'd love to have you. So thank you very much. Have a great lunch.